Well, we're going to be continuing reading through the Gospel of John. We are in John chapter 11 this morning, verse 1. That would be page 892 in that blue book in front of you. That's your pew Bible, if you want to follow along. John chapter 11, verse 1. John 11, 1 says, A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now this is the Mary who later poured out the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. I'd like to pause there right now. And uh, I would really like to spend some time talking about the two sisters. Because I find that we're either a Martha or a Mary. Every single one of you. Yes, Darren, even you. You're a Martha or a Mary. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> now, don't call names. Don't call names. I want to tell you a story. There was a pastor who wanted to see, kind of take the temperature of his congregation. So he thought he'd play, not a trick, but an experiment, we'll call it. So one Sunday morning, he came to church very early, and he dressed like a homeless person. He had a wig that was all matted. He had a fake beard he put on and like dental work that looked like funny teeth and real shabby clothes and worn out shoes. And he said, oh, let's see what people do. So he went and he sat right at the beginning or the entrance where you would pull into the church right there at the beginning of the driveway. And he had a sign that said, please help. And he sat there. And pretty soon the cars started coming in for Sunday morning. And they'd slow down and look at him, but then they would just not know what to do. So they'd drive on and just park and go into the church. This happened again and again and again. And it was getting to almost service time. And the pastor is still sitting there all shabby looking. And uh, a lady who was a single mom and her little girl came in. They were running late. And the little girl said, oh, that poor man. So when she got out of the... Um, car, she ran to him. And she had a sandwich. That she was uh, Always sandwiches, right? She, she, she had a sandwich. She goes, sir, are you hungry? Here, have my sandwich. And she had her little Mickey Mouse cup. Here, are you thirsty, sir? And, and sir, would you like to come in and sit down with us and, and maybe get warm? And the pastor kind of in disguise, he ambled in there and he walked past everybody and he walked up to the pulpit and he took off his disguise in front of everybody. It was me the whole time. And I wanted to take your temperature to see where you are. And the only one in this congregation that had compassion on me was this little girl. So that was like a, a shame on me moment, right? So that's, that's you know, experiment number one. Experiment number two. There was another pastor down the road, maybe a few miles down. And he heard, oh, okay, I'm going to try this too. So this pastor, he got all the shabby clothes, he got the wig and everything, put on the fake beard, the, the worn out shoes, the sign that said help me, and he put in the like fake dental work. And he went out early Sunday morning, and he sat at the entrance of his church to see what would happen. Well, as it happened, the head deacon pulled in, saw him sitting there, called the police, and the police came, I said, what are you doing sitting here? And the dental work got mushed up in his mouth and he couldn't speak. And said, all right, mister, in the car. So the pastor's in the backseat of the car, heading away to the jail. And finally he got the dental work out while he's in the backseat of the car. But, but officer, I'm the pastor. And the officers looked at each other. Sure you are. You're the pastor, right? So he goes to jail and he calls his wife early in the morning. He never told nobody. So his wife's like, what? So Mrs. Pastor went and bailed him out of jail and drives him to church. So he comes to church, he's still in the garb, and he takes it off in front of the congregation, and nobody else got to see him because he went to jail before anybody else even got there, right? So he tried to tell the story, and there's 
Mr. Deacon standing over there looking really ashamed. He was just like, oh, what did I do? I should have. <laughs> so the deacon came and he explained, listen, I'm sorry I called the cops on you, Pastor, but I love this church. He said, I'm the first one here. I make sure the temperature is just right. I'll shovel the, the walk if I can. I'll make sure that the kids have their chairs set up right. And, and I, I care. I love, the, I, love this, I love this church. It's such a big part of my life. And when I saw that guy, uh, you, <laughs> sitting there, I didn't know if you were psychotic. I didn't know if you had a weapon. I didn't know what to do with you. I didn't know how to talk to you. So I thought I'd call the police. They're experts at figuring this stuff out. So I called the cops on you and... The rest is history, right? So two different scenarios, two different pastors, two different churches, who was right? Now, you could see fault in either one, or you can see wisdom in either one. One was very pragmatic. One was just a little girl who had the faith of a child. She never thought about danger. She never thought about repercussions or consequences. All she saw in her heart was a guy who was in trouble, who might have been hungry or thirsty, a guy who had no one. That's all she saw. Whereas the deacon in the other scenario, he saw, well, I don't know this guy, but I love my people and I want to protect them. They were both right. They both came at it from a different point of view. But I think wisdom would teach us there's a little bit of middle ground here, right? Right? Anybody? Thank you, Lori. <laughs> well, she agrees with me. Let me, um, I want to introduce you to uh, Mary and Martha. Now, Martha, of course, Martha was the, I'll say she was the older sister. She was a good kid, right? The good sister. I would say she was a type A personality. Uh, she was dutiful. She was on task. She was efficient. She dotted the I's, crossed the T's. She made sure everything was just so, Right? She was all about the job, and she was faithful and hardworking. We need more Marthas in this world, right? I mean, it's great to have a Martha on your team. She takes care of things. And she heard, well, Jesus is coming to our house. Uh, you know, if you read in uh, Luke 10, 38, I'll just read the story to you real quick before I introduce Mary to you. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem... They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha, we just talked about her, welcomed him into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. I think she has a point, don't you? And she does. I'm, I'm not going to take that away from her. But listen to what Jesus says. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. So Martha was a little too involved in the work of the Lord, and he's trying to tell her to be in love with the Lord of the work. Okay? Now, let me just introduce Mary to you. You've already met Martha. She's dutiful, good kid, type A personality, task-oriented, wants to get the job done. Whereas Mary, I'll just call her a hippie. Come see, come sa. It's all good. Where can I find the joy? Where can I find the love? Oh, there's love over there. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. She is a hippie. She's hyper-spiritual. Oh, yeah, turn me on to that spiritual stuff, man. I'm all about the spiritual stuff. She's uh, not too into details. Ah, details, shmeetails. My sister will take care of that. I want to get the meat. I want to get to the heart of the matter. She's extravagant. I love you, Jesus. I don't care. I want everybody to know. I'm going to take the most expensive stuff I got, the spike nerd stuff. Might have cost, gosh, who knows in this uh, currency exchange, expensive. And every religious person lost their mind. There's Mary the hippie. All she wants is to feel good, to look good. I mean, she's all into this, 
the lovey hooby jooby stuff. We got work to do, and she's not about that. So she takes the spike nard and she dumps it on Jesus. And she's crying and she's wiping his feet with her own hair. She's worshiping him. Extravagant, not cost effective, <laughs> not, not very, what the, what the type A's would call, not very wise, not very prudent, <laughs> not at this juncture, <laughs> right? <laughs> And people were losing their mind. Mary, what are you doing? And Jesus said, let her alone. She's doing a good service for me. She's anointing me for my burial. She was tuned that way. Her spirit was on fire. She knew that she loved him. She wanted to worship him. She wanted to give everything to him. That was how she was rolling. How did she get there? Did she start that way? Did Mary come from shame did she have a shameful past? Did she get into maybe drugs and alcohol in her youth? You know, this is kind of the way it works. The most grateful, worshipful people that I've ever met come from a bad history. They've been through the stuff. They've been through the heartbreak. They've been through the disappointments in life. They've been through the self-inflicted wounds that we do. And when they come to Jesus, they're super, super thankful. And this appears to be Mary. So in every organization I've ever been involved in, whether it's a church or the workplace or even a family, I see Martha's and, and Mary's. You know, the Mary wants to get things done. She's efficient. You can trust her. She's always on time. She does a good job, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with making things happen. Um, I need people who are have that gift of administration who can, who can pay the bills. Otherwise, we'd all be meeting in a hovel somewhere down the road. If I was in charge, you don't want me doing that. You know, I'm, I'm like a, more the hippie type. But anyway, when you got someone who's just into the hoobie jubies and into the feeling good and all that, well, that's fine. But who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to get stuff done? On who's going to take care of stuff? We need them to work together ideally, don't you think that? And there's a risk. Here, here, here's one of my, my points. As I was reading this, I got hung up on the Mary and Martha thing, as you can tell. Uh, the risk of being a Martha is you can get arrogant. You can get mean. You can look down your nose at people. And the worst, the worst, if you're a Martha type, you can get self righteous. I'm not saying that Martha was self-righteous. She may have been close. But there's that risk. If you're a type A person who A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you want all the ducks in a row and you want everything fine, people like her sister Mary, they'll drive you nuts! And you will want to say, you lazy, no good, you just want to sit around, you want to eat all day, you don't want to help out, blah, blah. And you can get really cross that way. Ultimately, the best case scenario is Mary could say, you know what? I really love Jesus. This is awesome. But I tell you what, I'll team up with my sister. We'll get the job done. I'll help her set the table. I'm not a good cook. I'll let her do the cooking, but I'll help her spread things around. I'll help her get set. And then we'll both go and sit at the feet of Jesus. Wouldn't that be swell? Wouldn't that be ideal if they could work together? Families don't often work that way. Did you ever notice? Did you ever notice? There's another family Jesus tells us about. Two brothers. And you always hear about the one brother. You hardly ever hear about the other brother. The brother who was always there, always faithful, always took care of the animals, took care of the farm, didn't go to parties. He was a guy that daddy could trust, always there faithful and true. He was the prodigal son's older brother. Oh my we don't hear a lot of sermons about him. Who do we hear the sermons about? The deadbeat hippie brother said, Hey, Daddy, give me all my stuff. I'm going to go party with my friends. And the dad's like, okay. And, the, of course, the type A personality son, the, the good boy, the on task, uh, the, the, the straight A student, Dad... You're going to let this lame brain have his money? I mean, you're supposed to get your inheritance after you die. This guy doesn't even, dis he disrespects you. He's, he's off, man. Just throw the bum out. Let him just 
go. So when the younger brother comes back, you're familiar with this story. He was broken. You know this. He went out and he spent everything he had. All his so-called friends, they forsook him, right? And he had nothing. All he had to depend on was the mercy of dad. And he had this, remember, he had this speech all planned out when he came back home to his father. I know, Dad, I, I broke your heart. I did wrong. I, I, I shouldn't have done that to you, and I was so heartless and so cruel. I'm not even worthy to be in this house. I'm not worthy even to be a servant in your barn. If you just give me a little place to sit in your barn, I'll just sit there on some hay. I'll take care of the animals, and I'll be faithful from now on. He came back a broken man. When he left, he was the feel-good, good-time, party, 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 uh, hippie kind of kid. Don't care about consequences. I just want to feel good. I just want to, yeah, woohoo. When he came back, he was utterly broken. I would say he is pretty close to being a Mary. Didn't really care about helping out sis. Didn't really care about the farm or, or where his dad was in, in his business. He just cared about having fun. And when he came back broken, he was a different person. And of course, you know the story. The father, I mean, I'm getting off my message here, but the father was waiting for him, was praying for him, was hoping he'd come to his senses, and he welcomed him back. Just imagine this. You're the older brother, the type A personality, the good boy. He never did nothing to break your dad's heart. You're a, yes, dad, what can I do for you? Yep, I'll go to town, I'll do this, I'll stack this, I can do the hiring and fire, whatever, I'll be here for you, dad, always, always, always. So, there's the older brother out in the barn, he looks down the road and he sees that no good, lousy brother of his, with wearing rags, is probably smelling to high heaven, Oh, that jerk. How dare he? How dare he? He's such an idiot. He broke my dad's heart. He, he tarnished the family name. He wouldn't even do his chores. And he took all dad's money and he went away. Good for him. I hope he was in jail. I hope he has the plague. I hope he falls down and falls into a pit. I hope the wolves eat him. I don't know. There he is, that jerk. Well, dad's going to see him and dad's going to go out there and give him a piece of his mind. You idiot, I told you, blah, 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 you get in this house, blah, whatever, or else get out of here. I'm just going to stand here and watch and see how old daddy deals with him. Ha <laughs> ha. Can any of you relate to this anyway? Good for him, jerk. I've been in a family or two, haven't you? <laughs> well, he sees dad get up off the porch and run with all his might. Wow, that old man, he's running? My dad is running? My dad doesn't run. What, what's going on here? I know. He's going to go out there and strangle him. Yes! I'm going to sit here and watch old dad strangle that no good brother of mine. He starts running and he grabs him and he hugs him. Huh. And, the, and the younger son, he's trying to apologize like old dad. I'm like, shut up. And he kept kissing him. You're kissing this idiot? The older brother standing there incensed. You've got to be kidding me. And then... This stinky, rotten kid who was working in a pigsty, he, the dad throws his robe on him. What? He, he's, he's part of the family. He's still in the family. That robe means he's like one of us. And he's putting a robe on him to cover his nakedness, to cover his sin, to cover his treachery, his betrayal. What? Dad did what? And that's not the worst. He gives his son his signet ring, which is like a credit card. It's like the family crest. When you go to town with the ring, you put that stamp on it, it stands for the family. Put it on my dad's account. Put it on my dad's, he gives him a blank check. He gives this idiot the royal robe, the kissy kissy, and the credit card, the family credit card. And the older brother is <laughs> losing his mind. You've got to be kidding me. He's not right. He's wrong. He's a sinner. We should just stone him to death and be done with it. No, he's kissing him and loving him. And he's obviously forgiven him. I don't get it. And then the older brother's standing there and he hears dad call for the fatted calf. And he hears dad call for a feast. We're going to have a party because my son's home. The older son 
would not go near. He sat out in the barn, not coming in, not going in there. No, he's a jerk. I'm the good boy. He's a jerk. And dad, old daddy -o, goes out there and says, hey, come on in and join us. And the son says, dad, all these years, I have served you so faithfully. I set the tables. I do whatever, you know. And if a, if a dead beast around here, I call the cops on him. I take care of stuff, right? And this low life betraying, he's not fit for the family name. You throw a party for him? And when me and my friends get together, you don't give us nothing? I think he has a point, but there's a greater point here. Son, please, you I have always. You I love and appreciate, but your brother was dead. But now he's back. He was lost, and now he's found. There is a great lesson about the prodigal son coming back and being forgiven, but there's also a great lesson about the snotty older brother. Because <laughs> there is that danger, boys and girls, of being self-righteous. Why are you saying this, Tom? Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a very weird world. This world that we live in is upside down crazy. People are literally calling evil good and good evil. And they are throwing it in our faces. People are calling us crazy. It's getting to the point where they might just lock us all up just for being Christians. God forbid. But doesn't that make you mad? Doesn't that make you want to get in their face and tell them how wrong they are? Tell them how screwed up they are? Tell them they're going to burn in the lowest hell? Doesn't that make us just want to get angry and strangle a few people and turn over some tables? I understand. I understand. But remember this. I'm not saying you shouldn't be upset. You should. I am. I understand. But the God of this world has blinded the minds who, that they would believe a lie. They are blind. They don't even realize what they're saying or doing. Remember when Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. And, and Paul reminds us, such were some of you. Remember when we were lost? Remember the things that we used to say? Do you remember the things that we used to do until we found Jesus? I mean, they're doing wrong. There's no doubt. And it's upsetting. And we should say stuff. And we should stand up. But always remember where we came from. We can present ourselves to this dying world as an oasis of help. And we can tell them, I'm no better than you, man. But I once was lost. And now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see my friend. Jesus is the one who turned the lights on for me. And I'm different now. And I wish that for you, my friend. I wish that for you. Now these signs that you keep putting in my yard, and you guys who keep peeing in my grass, is like, I don't like that. But <laughs> maybe we could pray about this and get this worked out. Guys, please, don't think that I'm so self-righteous. Right? I am not. There's something that we learn about. God, I forgot, I forgot to write it down. Oh, well. I'm going to run from the top of my head. Do you think there's anything left on the top of my head to run off? <laughs> You're being kind. He has shown the old man what is good. What does the Lord require of thee? Three things. You, you remember this? Is that Habakkuk 6? Could you be my secretary on that young lady sitting there with the phone? Beep, beep, boop, 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 beep. <laughs> I don't have a beep, beep, boop up here. So, is it? He has shown the old man. What? Come on. What's God want? Come on. We're doing, we're doing all this good stuff. What does God expect? What does he want? The prophet told him. He said, he has already shown you what God wants. What does the Lord require of you? I think it is still required today. Micah 6.8. See, I just, I 
have it right here, and I did not write it down. Shame on me. Bad preacher. To do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly. We love, number one, do justly. Do the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. Why aren't you doing the right thing? You should do the right thing, too. Blah, blah, blah. You, 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 you. I'm good. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. I'm, to, I'm, I'm not saying that they're good. I'm saying, remember where you came from. Of course it's wrong. Of course they're lost. Of course they're destroying and they don't even realize they're doing it. Of course the Lord is the right way. Of course we understand what is right. We can see it like night and day, but we didn't used to. Remember? When we thought everything we felt, everything that just came down the pike was right until we found Jesus. Remember? This next one. Of course, do justly, do the right thing. Yes, do that. No question. Love mercy. Wait a minute. Mercy? What's that? Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. Well, that don't seem right. I know. Mercy was shown to me. I didn't deserve it. Did I deserve to be forgiven from that cross? Forgive them, they know not what they do. Did I deserve the mercy? No. But he's telling me, don't just do mercy. Love mercy. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I don't know if I love mercy. <laughs> I'm still working on this. Mercy, that's hard enough. But to love mercy? Are you kidding me? I don't have it in me to be that merciful. I don't. I'm working on it. Are you working on it too? Anybody out there besides me? Showing mercy? I want justice. I want that person to hang. I want that person to have a flat tire. I want the earth to open up and swallow that person. I want a piano to fall out of the sky on that person because they're stupid, because they're bad, because they've done this. Right? It's easy to want justice. Of course we do. I love justice. But do I love mercy? Uh, fail. Put it, put it. A fail in that category for me. Not just being merciful, but loving mercy. How on earth can I do this, Lord? Allow me. First off, by example. That prodigal son coming home, what did he deserve? <laughs> Life in prison? <laughs> just at least being turned away. He didn't deserve to be back in that form. Why did the father love him so much? I'll never know. But he does. My, my, my whole thing is, of course, there's evil. Of course, there's injustice. Of course, there's bad. And they're celebrating it. And they're throwing it in our face every day. Am I right? I mean, it makes you mad. It makes you upset. Of course. And you want to set people straight? Yes. And when you have your opportunity to speak, you should speak. I, I'm not saying don't do that. All I'm saying is be careful of that risk of being self-righteous. It's a risk. Jesus doesn't want you to appear to be self-righteous. Speak the truth, but speak it in what? Love. I used to be like you. I do not like what you're doing. I do not like what you're saying. I'm not about that anymore because of Jesus. I don't think you should do that. But if you get a flat tire, I'm going to help you. If, you. if it's a cold, rainy night, I'll help you take the groceries into your house. Are you kidding me? you got to learn this stuff, man. Showing mercy, it ain't easy. I've told so many stories that you've heard before, I don't want to upset my wife and, and repeat all these stories to you. Do justly, love mercy. Give people a break. Ease up a little bit on them. Don't wish damnation on them. <laughs> don't wish death on them. Wish salvation on them. Wish healing on them. They may or may not turn, who knows? But for your part, learn to love mercy. Don't even appear to be self-righteous. I used to do what you do, man. I used to feel like you feel. I don't agree with this anymore. I've been changed because of Jesus. Nothing self-righteous about that. You're pointing to the Lord, the one who transforms, the one who wins hearts and changes hearts. That's our message. Not that they're right, not that they're doing good at all. Some of it's downright dangerous to our children. 
into our way of life. Yes, I'm not sticking up for that. But in these days, remember mercy and learn, I hate this word, uh, love mercy. Oh, that hurts so bad. Give people a break, ease off them, and remember your faults. Number three, what does the Lord require of you? Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Remember, you're saved by grace. Be thankful. Remember the grace he has given you. Wish that grace on somebody else. Yeah, you could cause a ruckus right now. Yeah, you could take out a few people with your left and your right. And, you know, maybe you got, you know, yeah, yeah, you could. But don't do it. Who on planet Earth was more humble than Jesus himself? When they were beating him and stabbing him and knocking him around and putting that crown of thorns on him, do you think that he couldn't have reared up and took them all out with a word? Do you think for one minute that he couldn't have called ten thousands of angels to clear the decks right away? Yeah, he could have. He didn't. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Wait a minute. Let's go back to justice here. We deserve death. He doesn't. Why would he die? Why would he submit himself to this terrible beating, this terrible treatment, the terrible word? Why? Humility. Humility. Have you ever been in a place where you were put down and put on and you just humbly bowed your head and started praying while they're going off. It's, that's a hard call, man. That's a hard call. Jesus took it all. He took it all, all the way. All the way until the point he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He took your debt and my debt all the way. He most certainly did not deserve that. He most certainly did not. You and I deserve that. We're guilty. He's innocent. Humility isn't concerned about that. Humility is, Lord, what can I do for you? Even if it hurts, what can I do for you? How can I represent you in this situation? They're all calling me names. They're all spitting on me. They're all saying all these weird, evil stuff things on me. I could just as easily get up and take them all out with a baseball bat. I could do it. I know I could. Pretty good with a bat. <laughs> but you know what Lord like when Stephen you remember in the book of Acts Stephen's face shined like an angel they were so mad at him for being righteous this is in the book of Acts young Stephen told them the gospel and it drove them nuts and they stoned him to death and he never raised a finger to defend himself guys I'm not there yet I'm not even going to stand up here and lie to you this special man with a special gift of the Spirit was humble until his death. And just before he breathed his last, he reported this. I see standing beside the throne of God, my Jesus. And when he closed his eyes after that stoning, he went directly to the presence of God Almighty. And he was ushered in by Jesus himself. Here's my servant, Stephen. And the thing I like about that Stephen spoke the gospel. For that, he was condemned to death, and they were stoning him. Jesus stood and gave him a standing ovation. May that be our story. He could have ran away. He could have said, oh, guys, take it easy. I don't mean all this stuff. And he could have saved his skin that day. He could have. But he humbled himself under that penalty, and he stood for the Lord. That is amazing, isn't it? I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, I'm, 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 I'd do that too. God help me. <laughs> Things haven't got that ugly for us here in the United States of America. My only, my message is here, be a Martha. Be on task, man. Do the job. Dot the I's, cross the T's. Always do good work. But don't get so down on other people. Don't. Let yourself be self-righteous. And if you're a Mary, and you love the Word of God, and you just want to be, woohoo, you want to feel good, hippy-dippy, let's worship, let's get loud. Yeah, 
Let's feel it, man. Let's shout it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Jesus, of course, he applauded that. But how about you put your tambourine down for a second? Go help your sister. Get the stuff together. And then both of you come and do the oomch, 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 the party time in the presence of the Lord. How about that? Wouldn't that be a cool thing? So Martha's and Mary's. Oh, my sister, she's so lazy. Oh, my brother, he never gets off that couch. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, and the Lord's got your back. He's given us, he's shown us what is good. I mean, please don't get down on the Marthas. And uh, every once in a while, you've got to shake up a Mary or two. <laughs> like, come on, Mary, we can just do this, and then we'll get back to the worship. Yeah, of course. So, if you saw your pastor... <clears throat> Pretending to be a homeless guy. <laughs> what would you do? Go to Subway? No, take me to Subway. You're so close, Deb, so close. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, has this worked out for you? I understand, is it a good message? I mean, the reason my heart is... We are living in such astonishingly evil days. My heart breaks for America. And we have kids and grandkids. We're trying to bring them up into this world. And man, I think about how good I had it when I was a kid. Riding my bike with my handlebars and my banana seat and the big, you know, the, all the stuff and the baseball cards and the spoon and just... I had nothing to worry about. Oh, not a care in the world. All the kids I know are so stressed out. They're so full of anxiety. They're halfway depressed. They don't want to, they can't go out and play in the street like we used to. It's just a different world, and I hate that. You know, so I, am I crazy to pray for a world where our kids can just go out in the street and play until the street light comes on? <laughs> so this is my heart. Uh, God loves sinners. Thank God, or I wouldn't be here. God can change a heart and a mind. Let's not forget the mercy part while we're standing up for our rights. That's, that's all I want to say. So let me pray for you. We're all together in this. I mean, I'm not for one minute thinking I'm better than anybody. We're all going through this. Father, I lift up every soul in this building every soul within the sound of my voice. And I ask for mercy. I ask for grace. I ask that we learn, that you help us learn how to be humble, that you help us do what's right, that you help us stand for what's right. But Lord, we pray for sinners. We pray for lost people. We pray for these angry, hurting, messed up folks that we could have easily been had not been for you. So those ones in our family, those ones in our neighborhoods, those ones in our country with the microphone shouting at us all day long. We pray your mercy. We pray your healing. We pray your salvation. And Lord, we lift up America to you. We turn from our wicked ways. We turn from our sins. We acknowledge that we have sinned before you. We've killed the unborn. We've destroyed the lives of our children. We've sat back and watched as our education systems have fallen into disrepair. We've just said, oh, well. Lord, we apologize. We repent of these sins we've done to our land. And we ask you, Lord, to start a healing in our own hearts. That you help us learn how to love sinners, how to pray for sinners, how to stand up in our families in love, in, in our workplaces, in our schools, and in our communities. Lord, help us learn. And I pray your spirit would fall on us. And, and help us and strengthen us in these, these times, Lord. Have mercy on America. For the sake of our children and our grandchildren, I pray this. And I pray this over every soul who can hear me. The blessing that God told Aaron to place on the people. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. I pray this on you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one, that I ask it. Everybody say, Amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Don't forget to love mercy.